You're listening to Let's Talk Sustainable Business. Hello, my name is Uwe Schulte, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our podcast series, Let's Talk Sustainable Business. The series is brought to you by the Conference Board Global Sustainability Center. Today, I will be talking to Cyril Giraud, Senior Vice President, Performance Minerals, APAC at Emiris. Please let me introduce our guest to, for today. Cyril joined Emiris in 1998 and held a number of positions in strategy, finance, project management, or general management. He has been based in different countries, in Asia and Europe, where he was leading the carbonates business until 2018. Since then, Cyril has been a member of the Emirates Executive Committee, and he's based in Shanghai. Welcome, Cyril. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and how sustainability has entered your professional life. Hello, Uwe, and first, I'm uh, very happy to be with you uh, today and to share about sustainability, which is a, a very important uh, topic for, for me. Um, you, you said it in the introduction, but I had the opportunity in my career uh, with Emeris to work in a number of different uh, geographies, and that uh, opened my eyes to uh, quite a number of uh, different uh, things. And maybe I should start by uh, telling a couple of stories uh, which uh, uh, triggered my interest for sustainability uh, in the past. Um, you know that in our business, we have some mining activities, or I should rather say some uh, quarrying activity, because most of our mines are in fact uh, open pits or quarries, uh, but it means they are very visible. Uh, for uh, outside uh, people uh, coming uh, coming close to them. So it's a very sensitive topic, usually. And um, in the beginning, when I joined Emiris, I didn't realize how sensitive it could be because we have rather high standards. We have good practices, benchmarks on how to rehabilitate a mine which is uh, out of use, for instance. And I was assuming it was the standard across uh, the industry. Then, uh, along the years, I discovered a few different situations. Like, I remember one time in Turkey, for instance, a huge area of uh, queries uh, in uh, use since the Roman times and over the centuries a number of small or big pits all over the place, uh, a lot of uh, unused blocks uh, covering the full uh, landscape. So really a kind of situation that you think it's out of control and it will never uh, be restored, never. Uh, then I discovered in Vietnam some situations where you had what we call monkey mining, which is basically people coming on the top of a cliff, uh, put, putting a rope uh, around the tree and going down the face of the quarry and then just starting uh, with their hammer uh, to uh, uh, break some rocks and people uh, below uh, just uh, getting the rocks. So no need to say that it's absolutely not safe and you have a lot of accidents uh, with that. And on the top of it, uh, when you start to exploit a quarry like that, uh, it's extremely difficult to rehabilitate properly and to do something nice uh, with it after uh, you have finished uh, to exploit it. Uh, in our case, what we try to do is to have some clear benches, well established, which are much safer and on the top of it, when you have finished, you can rebuild some slopes, put some vegetation onto it, uh, create some small lakes or ponds at the bottom, etc. So uh, much, uh, much nicer structure. The second thing which uh, alerted me, if I may say, some years ago, it was more than 15 years ago, was um, a conference that I attended uh, in China. It was one of my first visits in China at the time. And uh, the topic of sustainability came, and I realized how big the gap was between my own meaning of sustainability and the meaning of uh, the Chinese attendance. And for them, the only thing which mattered at the time was sustainability is for me, how can I secure more reserves of uh, whatever raw materials I need to sustain economic growth in the future? Nothing else. And that made me think that behind the same word, you can have very different meanings. Uh, and today, 
I'm living in China, as you mentioned in the beginning, and I'm pleased to see that it has evolved. Uh, now you have a kind of cohabitation of both, securing long-term resources, but also taking care of the environment and how you do it. So I think that's a good evolution over time. Yeah, that's uh, that's quite a, a journey of um, uh, bad examples. That's <laughs> not 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 very nice. Uh, but uh, the good news is, of course, that uh, there are better practices, and we'll talk about the practices you'd already mentioned from Emirates a little bit more. But before we do, um, uh, not all of our audience will be familiar with your company. Uh, could you explain a little bit more about your business? Yes, sure. Um, Imeris is a global leader in uh, industrial minerals. It's a multinational company uh, based in, uh, in France, uh, generating 4.4 billion uh, revenue. Uh, it's a listed company on the stock exchange, and uh, we are employing 17,000 uh, employees. Uh, we are selling in uh, 140 countries, so really a multinational activity. Uh, our business is organized in two main categories. Uh, performance minerals, which is a business I'm uh, active in, and high temperature uh, solutions. So overall, uh, what we are really uh, targeting is to create through our solutions some value for our customers and overall for a better uh, tomorrow. Yeah, that um, th it's clear everybody has heard the word minerals and all of that, but maybe you can um, describe a little bit more what types of products uh, you provide because, you know, um, not everybody knows where minerals actually go. Yeah, that's a very good point. And uh, this is what is in fact really unique and fascinating in, uh, with, uh, with our business uh, is that our products are everywhere, but almost no one knows about them. Uh, and in fact, uh, the applications you have almost a limitless number uh, of them, uh, but they are all around you uh, in, your, uh, in your daily life. For instance, uh, you have some uh, calcium carbonate in your toothpaste, you have uh, some uh, kaolin in uh, your uh, bathroom uh, floor tiles, you have some talc in your, uh, in your uh, cars, in the plastic parts of your car, you have some uh, diatomite which uh, is used to filter uh, the beer uh, you are drinking or the oil you are using uh, for uh, cooking a and many, many others. I could also mention uh, uh, cosmetics, I could uh, mention uh, uh, some components for uh, uh, batteries, uh, for electrical batteries, uh, etc. So this is really a key component participating in many, many things which contribute to our lives, our homes and uh, our economies in general. Um, you just surprised me. I have to say talc in cars. Is, talc is for me something that people use to uh, sort of powder uh, themselves to avoid uh, sweating. <laughs> It's also used for that, but it has many, many other applications. And uh, for, for this specific example, when you add uh, the proper talc uh, to uh, the polymer uh, in, uh, in your plastic mm -hmm. compound, you manage to get the same mechanical properties while having a lighter plastic part. So no need to say that thanks to that, you can save uh, some energy and therefore uh, you can uh, consume less fuel for uh, internal combustion engine cars or uh, you can uh, have a longer battery range for uh, electrical vehicles. Yeah, that's um, that, that's a broad product portfolio, but, but uh, I guess uh, that means that you have a huge variety of customers um, uh, because these applications are so different. Or does that go through a, 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 a trader in between? No, you're right. Uh, the fact is that we have uh, thousands of customers, uh, small mm. ones, uh, large companies, uh, etc. So we have uh, a, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of different customers in different industries. I understand. Now, you, you already mentioned in your story how, how sustainability uh, and the understanding of it developed for yourself, um, that you've seen practices that aren't uh, very conducive um, to the community and the wildlife um, uh, of, of mining and quarrying. Um, 
and there's also, uh, as I learned recently, a very significant greenhouse gas footprint of uh, some of these operations. How do you actually, you already mentioned it a little bit, but how do you actually approach these challenges? Um, the, the way we approach it is uh, to try uh, to be uh, as uh, organized and as comprehensive as, uh, as possible. Uh, we, we have always been uh, quite proud of behaving as a responsible company, uh, but uh, I would say we have gone to the Uh, next step uh, a few years uh, a few years ago and now we have really a full comprehensive scheme defining clear objectives and communicating about it uh, communicating for uh, two reasons first internally to reinforce awareness uh, because it's such an important topic and second uh, externally because we are taking official commitments and we want people to be aware about it and we want to be bound uh, to uh, to this commitment uh, a, a, as well mm. so so, yes, all in all, uh, we, we consider that one of our core values is, is about enabling a better future. And due to our specific position in the value chain, we really have a strong role to play in that. Uh, and it's towards our employees, towards the communities uh, in which we work, towards the environment in, uh, in more general. So to come back to your initial question, we can really do something about uh, how we approach uh, this, this change. Uh, we can do it in a direct way by taking actions to reduce our own footprint, the so CO2 emissions, how we manage our mines, uh, how we manage the consumption of water or the energy consumption, etc. But also indirect, indirectly, uh, like our solutions, they can help our customers in turn to be more efficient as uh, uh, the example I mentioned about talc in plastic is a good one, for instance, but we try to do that across the full value chain. So we also try uh, to do it upstream by pushing our suppliers to enter into the same kind of, uh, of process mm -hmm. uh, in that respect. Now, um, let, let's spend a, a second on that carbon footprint, because I was very surprised to learn if you take the whole mining industry around the world it has almost as big a footprint um, as uh, the uh, cement industry. Uh, that surprised me. Where, where does that actually happen? Where, where does the, that large footprint come from? Um, well, I must say I have not seen these statistics and uh, mm. the cement industry being so so large, I'm a bit surprised that it uh, it's almost as big mm. uh, as it is. Uh, surely we have uh, some... Uh, Uh, we have some CO2 emissions uh, from uh, uh, the mines themselves, but it's usually fairly limited because uh, you have uh, some uh, some trucks, dumpers, etc. Uh, but that's pretty much about it. And then you have the process, uh, the process of refining the, the minerals, grinding them, mm. purifying them, etc. So depending on which... Uh, and uh, material we, we talk about, uh, it could generate more or less uh, CO2. And, and definitely the cement industry, uh, in a way, it's part of it because cement starts with uh, calcium carbonate queries. So that probably is a significant part of it as well. Yeah, uh, I wasn't implying that your operations, which are actually, uh, you know, open queries and all of that, uh, um, Uh, have a larger contribution there, but um, it, I guess it's it's um, you know when you do uh, iron ore mining and stuff like that um, that there is a lot of energy uh, required not only um, to to do the mining but also the transporting and 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 all of that. So um, it is um, it is always good to to. to um, look at these things but then it's also not very useful if you generalize it around just an industry in principle every company has to do their own footprint and we'll mm -hmm. we'll talk about this a little bit more um you you um you're talking about um i, I saw that on your website sustainability Can you explain what that is? Yes, sustainability is is the name of our ESG program that we have developed with Numeris. Uh, obviously, it's a combination of sustainability and agility, uh, and um, it's built around three pillars, uh, which are empowering our people, 
caring for the planet and building for the future. So uh, if I take the three of them, uh, empowering our people is really to make sure our employees can operate in uh, safe conditions, stay healthy, uh, but also to promote their development, uh, the diversity and inclusion, fostering social di dialogue, uh, etc. So that's really something where we want uh, these values to be embedded in the behaviors and the way of working of all uh, our employees. The second pillar, which is caring for the planet, this is really about protecting the environment, uh, taking measures to reduce uh, our consumption of uh, non-energetic resources, preserving the biodiversity, uh, and uh, acting on the climate change uh, as well. And uh, the last one, building for the future, is really to operate in a ethical, fair manner, uh, and to, to really engage uh, throughout the supply chain. I mentioned the suppliers uh, to engage them in, uh, in sustainability as well, but also uh, with the communities where we operate uh, and promote in general sustainable products and technologies. Yeah, and you know, the, the one thing that um, comes always to mind for me when, when we're talking about quarrying and mining is... Um, that we make an impact on the immediate uh, ecosystem there. It's unavoidable, of course. Um, and the question is, how, how can one do that uh, in a manner that um, avoids biodiversity loss? You, you, you are very active in that field. Can you explain a little bit how you actually do that? Yes, that's a good point. We, we are very active and um, it all starts for me uh, to uh, by being humble about it. Uh, I think we are having good programs, but uh, you can always uh, improve. And this is what we are trying to do. And when I say humble about it, it means that alone, we cannot achieve so much. So uh, we what we are doing is uh, to build partnerships and to request some assistance from experts uh, who can guide us in uh, in improving. Um, we when we do that, we also communicate. I come back to communication because it's so important. Like um, every year, we have one full day where we communicate to our employees. We stop all the plants at the same time in the world to communicate about employees uh, with employees about critical topics. And we always talk about safety. And last year, 2021, we also dedicated a workshop on biodiversity. So huge impact. And by doing that, we insist on the actions we take. Like for instance, we have developed partnerships with the French National Museum of uh, Natural History, who has uh, renowned experts uh, in that field. And we also promote uh, internally uh, awareness and actions to reduce our biodiversity impact. Uh, for instance, when you are in the mining industry, one of the most uh, obvious or visible impact you can have is the loss of habitat uh, for, uh, for animals living in the, in the area. Uh, it's fairly obvious to, to say, but uh, by doing uh, progressive restoration, uh, meaning uh, you rehabilitate the area, you plant trees again, etc. when you have finished to exploit one area uh, while uh, exploiting the next one, you your impact is uh, much, uh, uh, much reduced compared to the situation where you just exploit the big query over the years and only after tens of years when it's finished, you start the rehabilitation process. So that's the kind of things we are trying to promote. We also take um, good... Uh, can, can I just yeah? briefly interrupt sure. you there? Because uh, uh, I want to make sure that I understood it correctly. So what you're saying is... When you do a quarry, um, you you will um, sort of open up part of the the landscape, and before you go to the next part of uh, the same quarry, you will actually start restoring the first part. Is, is that what you that, described? That's exactly the point. It's not always possible. It depends about the configuration uh, mm -hmm. of the site, but uh, there are many cases where it is possible and uh, you can work uh, in uh, different areas. And once you have finished with one area, you can start to rehabilitate it. Interesting. And, and that way, uh, the, the recuperation 
of the ecosystem is easier because the disruption doesn't last that long. It's, it's faster, that you're right. It's easier uh, and it's less impactful because the net area that is used for our operations yeah. uh, in average uh, is much uh, reduced uh, in that configuration. Sorry, I interrupted you, please. No, 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 no issue. It's important to, to make the, the points as clear as possible. Um, the, the other point I want to make uh, to mention is uh, the possible impact that we may have uh, on, on pollution. So we are really uh, taking a lot of care to reduce our impact to the environment by having monitoring uh, programs uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to check Uh, what could be our impact and to take actions uh, to uh, to avoid as much as possible uh, uh, negative things that could uh, happen so we have tools for that we have what we call for instance an environment maturity matrix which is assessing for each site uh, if we have good practices if not what can we improve if people running the site are really committed uh, to um, uh, to these actions uh, and so on so All in all, uh, the important thing to keep in mind is that there are really three different phases where we can have a big uh, impact. The first one is during the preparation. When we think about uh, opening a new query or expanding a query, we make uh, studies to assess the impact on the ecosystem uh, and to uh, find remediation. Uh, it's also obviously very important uh, as well for reassuring uh, and explaining to the local community what we will do, but also what we will, uh, will not do. Uh, then you have the phase when uh, we are running the operations. Uh, and here we continue to be uh, careful about uh, what, uh, what we could find. And I can give you an example which happened uh, last year uh, in one of my operations in New Zealand. Um, we discovered a kiwi nest uh, in one of our sites. Mm -hmm. And the kiwi, as you know, is a protected species, and uh, this bird yeah. is uh, the emblem of New Zealand. Uh, so we took it very uh, seriously, obviously, and we mandated an expert to come assess the t t situation so that we can take the right action to, um, to, to protect uh, the, the kiwi. And we took this opportunity to initiate a wider program to identify the kiwi habitat in the region and make sure we can uh, minimize uh, the, the impact. So that's, that's, I think, a good example as well of uh, the fact that we continue to take care when we operate. And finally, the last step is the rehabilitation or restoration. I mentioned a little bit about it already, but uh, this is obviously the very important because this is what is left after. Uh, and here, uh, there can be a big difference between uh, restoration, which is done uh, according to good practice and the rules, where you end up having uh, something uh, quite uh, uh, good or even very good according to the expert in many cases in terms of uh, biodiversity with uh, vegetation, with ponds, with uh, uh, new soil, trees, whatever. Uh, and the uh, rest... All in all, we have evidence that a restored habitat in, is in fact very often uh, favorable to, uh, to biodiversity. So that's uh, for us a uh, big point of attention as well. Now, I think that uh, that is an important point you make there because in, 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 in theory, uh, it could be possible that we actually or that you restore this to, to a way of being more amenable to the circumstances of the of the existing ecosystem so that actually the gene pool and the variety of species increases compared to before you even started. Yes, indeed. And uh, the, the fact is that by definition, we will not be able to restore it in exactly the same condition as before. Sure. But what we do can, in some cases, bring even more value. Uh, uh, as I mentioned already, very often uh, when you have uh, an unused query it, it leaves a hole in the in the ground and a good way uh, is to fill it with water in order uh, to have a pond or a lake or whatever and this in turn can attract uh, more uh, species of birds animals etc so this is the kind of things which in fact end up having a positive impact on biodiversity and sometimes even for the community of course yeah um But we'll, we'll, we'll focus on biodiversity for the time being. Um, the, um, 
the interesting point for me is that I learned uh, that you guys are doing something that we at the conference board believe is a very important part of the sustainability approach corporations should take to actually reach out and be a leader and, and bring others in. Um, can you explain how you do that? Um, yes, uh, in fact, we have um, we have concluded two key partnerships in that in that respect. I mentioned already the first one. Uh, this is with the French Museum of Natural History. It's mm -hmm. a partnership that we initiated in 2018 and which brings a lot of knowledge and uh, expert uh, and outside uh, guidance uh, for all our actions. Uh, on the top of it, we are also a member of Act for Nature. Uh, this is a forum of uh, companies and different public actors, scientists, uh, etc., uh, uh, for which the, the goal is uh, to make biodiversity uh, a, a bigger priority overall, as big as uh, climate change. Uh, and for us, it's a strong commitment, and uh, being part of it helps us to get also some feedback and to be part of uh, uh, global dynamics of uh, actions and to make some official commitment to, um, uh, to, to improve the situation. For instance, uh, we had uh, work on uh, combat, uh, combating invasive uh, alien species uh, oh, yeah. or uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of things. And the, the other benefit is that uh, we can, in turn, uh, bring these experts uh, in our queries, and they uh, find it a very good uh, uh, kind of open air laboratory, if I may say so, <laughs> uh, to study uh, biodiversity in different uh, conditions. So we are enriching each other uh, by uh, uh, providing different situations, different information, uh, benchmarks, guidance, recommendations, and that's really, really helpful to us. No, I uh, I understand that that's that's very very encouraging. Uh, t time actually flies, and um, we have to come to an end for today. But you you really raised my curiosity about your sustainable solutions. Yeah, how how, how your products can actually help um, uh, solve solving some of the sustainability challenges your customers are facing. Uh, and um, and uh, I hope we can discuss that in the next episode a little bit more. Uh, for for today, uh, I would like to, to thank you, Cyril, for uh, enlightening us uh, about um, the issue of biodiversity and how it can be uh, at, uh, resolved uh, around um, mining and quarrying. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's great also for me to have the opportunity to drive you through some of what we are doing. Uh, in turn, this is also helping us to, to show what we are doing and how important it is for us. So uh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, no, I hope uh, that your partnership extends because this is such an uh, important issue. For our audience, uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe to our podcast series or explore the entire catalog of our podcast programming from the conference board by visit visiting our website at tcb.org slash podcast. You can also write to us at uh, sustainability at tcb.org. And for today, I would like to thank you for listening and please join you, us again when we continue this conversation with Sarah. For today, goodbye. That was Let's Talk Sustainable Business.